Today, many people pursue artistic experiences, not as their livelihood, but as a valued part of their leisure time. I'm Kathy Malloy. The whole notion of having leisure time for our own personal interests is a relatively new phenomenon. The boom period that followed World War II produced the economic and lifestyle changes that made leisure a newfound commodity. People suddenly had time on their hands and were looking for enjoyable, edifying ways to fill it. When I moved from Toronto to Kitchener in the 1950s, I wanted to take a night course. Kitchener Collegiate was offering just three, typing, cooking, and art. I looked further into the cooking and all it was was very basic, dicing carrots. So I thought, forget that, and I took the art. How different and less frustrating my life would have been if I had had the good sense to take the typing. The job of developing art classes and other night courses for adults fell to Lloyd Minshall, then with the Community Programs Branch of the Ontario Ministry of Education. Uh, I was simply there as a person to help facilitate the interest in art that the people had. Uh, I was not an artist. I really haven't too much uh, understanding or knowledge of art. But subject matter was purely secondary as far as we were concerned. If there were enough people who were interested in the activity, then uh, we would encourage that activity to be included in a night school program. But we were really the beginning uh, of, of this total development. And yes, a totally different approach because leisure was something that very few people uh, even talked about, let alone enjoyed. Classes need teachers, but who would teach the teachers? For the task of training art leaders, Lloyd Minshall turned to Gordon Cooling. Gordon Cooling was an outstanding artist, teacher, author, and local historian. He taught at the University of Guelph for over 25 years, Yet, in his own quiet way, Gordon Cooling kept his many achievements to himself. Gil Stelter undertook a series of lectures to make the community aware of Gordon Cooling. For Gordon, art was not art for art's sake. He wasn't interested in becoming a famous artist. Perhaps he realized he didn't have certain qualities that would make him a Picasso or something of that sort. But Art, for art's sake, was always secondary. And art, in fact, I think, became an instrument, an agency for something else. And that something else, I think, can be largely summed up by the word community. And community in several respects. Because ultimately, I think his art is a search for the meaning of community. And by this, I mean his sketches and his drawings and his historic work and his historical conservation work and so on are all attempts to understand how people relate to buildings and how buildings relate to each other and how all of these set in a natural way into the environment create the notion of community and I think he pursued this he taught a whole number of people over the years as you know uh, as you yourself uh, uh, personally have experienced uh, and made the general public aware of art. You can't go to a building in Guelph, whether it's the public library or the Cutting Club or the university uh, or other places, without seeing a Gordon Cooling painting on the wall. A good artist isn't necessarily a good teacher, but Gordon Cooling was both. He shared his knowledge so generously. And when he taught, he looked at your work of art from your perspective, not only his. We couldn't have had a better person training teachers. Gordon Cooling and, and Lloyd Mitchell set up these classes at uh, Guelph at McDonald Institute. And we had to go and the, take these one-week courses. They only, I think it was $17 if you boarded in or something to take for a whole week. 
In the morning they taught leadership training, in the afternoon they taught your subject, whether it was art or whatever subject you would be teaching. Suddenly we became aware of the abstract movement, the fact that there was no subject matter in a lot of the paintings, and the picture itself was the painting. And then, shortly after, I started to study with Gordon Cooling, who's taught us a 12-week course in art history, and he went right back to the beginnings, right through the period of Picasso and abstractionism, and he said that in order to create something, you must break something down. So we began to work with paint itself as a subject, rather than looking at an object, going out and painting a tree, a river, some snow, or a brook. And we began to just take the paint and make it be the subject. The evening art classes left many enthusiastic students wanting more. In January 1954, the Five Counties Art Association was formed so that area artists could better organize sketch trips, more advanced workshops, and even exhibitions of their work. The name Five Counties referred to Waterloo, Wellington, Halton, Dufferin, and Peel, those served by Lloyd Minshall's Community Programs Branch. Maybe I had a bit of a warm spot for the art people because they seem to have the desire and the drive to go further, faster than any of the other activities in the geographic area that I served. And yes, I did issue uh, an invitation. Not only were they at our cottage, but they were also in our home. Uh, I, I have in the collection that you're going to see a picture of the cottage that was done by Peter Getz. I have uh, a picture of, of the same cottage from a totally different point of view by Harold Muller. Uh, they are two pictures which we prize, and they hang in our cottage most of the time. Our very first sketching trip was held at the Trails Inn Hotel in Conestoga the old one, the one that burnt. Mm -hmm. It was planned by um, John Schlachter, Gordon Cooling, and H Lloyd Mitchell. And that's the spot they chose. And we had the meeting upstairs, and then we all painted outside. We had over a hundred people out to our very first sketch trip. It was a wonderful place. I thought, I have been in heaven. This is my very first art trip, and met all these wonderful people, had this great chicken dinner, a free room at this snazzy hotel, <laughs> and a dance, all in one day. One of the favorite spots for artists get-togethers was the Homer Watson House at Dune, now part of Kitchener. In 1948, the late Ross Hamilton, an employee of Waterloo Trust, was given the Homer Watson estate to administer. Rather than see the 150-year-old homestead of one of Canada's foremost landscape painters be put up for sale, Ross Hamilton bought the house himself and established the Dune School of Fine Art. The school's popular instructors included some top names in Canadian art, people like Fred Varley, York Wilson, Carl Schaefer, Jack Bechtel, Alex Miller, Ted Jackson, Jim Gordnier, Percy Reynolds, Dorothy Stevens, and Adrian Dingle. Five County Art Association members always looked forward to Dune in June, a time of fun and painting in an ideal setting. You know, we used to have 16 cabins all around the outside with the Augustus John down there in the center where we froze <laughs> at night. And uh, it was a little Shangri-La. We were not far out of town, but you could have been a million miles away. The uh, 
fellowship, the friendship, the, you were in, in an entirely different world. Everything was color, form, painting and fellowship and singing. And mm -hmm. I remember when Carl Schaefer was here and we'd go up over the hills and uh, at that time they had, they were still uh, sheafing the wheat by hand and there were these sheaves all around and he was drawing them and, and doing his uh, watercolors the way only Carl could do them and the kids were getting excellent work out of them. They could see the, trend, the progress that they were making from when they started early in the summer. A classroom situation did not really exist at the Dune School. The classes were very relaxed and casual and weather permitting were always outside. New Dundee was a favorite spot. I can remember Carl Schaefer telling the students who were sketching at New Dundee that if they wanted a critique of their work, they could find him drinking a beer and having a pickled egg at the inn. And that's exactly where I found him. After Ross Hamilton's untimely death in 1952, his wife Bess took on the extensive operation of the Dune School. Yeah, Bess worked awfully hard and she enjoyed it though. She was cook and hostess and uh, mother confessor to the youngsters. She kept all the teenagers in the main house so she could look after them and see that they didn't get into any trouble. And uh, Bess was always available if we didn't have a model to sit oh, for us. That's right, she uh, used to model uh, for the class. And we sat under this tree and uh, we had to keep watch for the apples falling down. <laughs> and uh, also the shadows made it very interesting and also very difficult. You could see some of the portraits had come out, they'd be all green. And then of course we'd sit around and uh, criticize the uh, work that we'd each had done. And it was surprising how many different uh, formats had been used, how many different types of, picture, of painting had done, gone on off the same model. We loved it here at Dune, and no one loved it more than Eric Hancock. On Friday afternoons on his way home from work, he'd often drop by, oh, to talk to Bess or the teachers, just generally enjoy the school. I can remember one hot Friday afternoon I was up the road from the school in a very hot field, producing a masterpiece, of course. And, oh, I was dying for a cold drink. Unbeknownst to me, Eric crept up behind me and he said, what'll you have, a rum and coke or a gin and tonic? I turned around and there he was, with a glass in each hand. I even had a choice. I couldn't believe it, it was manna from heaven. But Eric was like that. As an early president of the five counties, Eric Hancock helped plan the ongoing training of art instructors through the association's teachers council. And I had some ideas. One was that the teachers should have a rounded knowledge and a rounded experience in the, all the different kinds of art. So we set up with this elite group uh, a, set, a meetings where we had painting by music and we had sculpting with uh, Mrs. Lewis was teaching this clay sculpting which I found to be fabulous. That's After painting portraits where you had to push this side back with, with line uh -huh. and color to be able to get the clay and just actually move it back and turn the thing around. And, but you know, I'd never done the back of a head. I'd <laughs> never seen the back of a head because you, there's no point in painting the back of anybody's yeah. head. And so uh, these were getting popular and more and more popular. And all mm -hmm. the teachers who hadn't shown up for years were back in there because it was, they were great weekends. And uh, then we got asked by some of our better member, our better painters, who were members of the of the five counties of the Central Ontario, if they could come, and there was no way we could refuse. They were they were better than I was, mm -hmm. and as good as any of our other teachers. So uh, it enlarged until we finally said, well, we won't do it anymore. Whatever we do, we'll open to the whole membership, yeah. and so. We still have the nucleus of the teachers' council, so that there always be somebody to teach. Mm -hmm. And they were t they were giving of their time for free, mm -hmm. and they would uh, 
do the criticisms at the end and some of the things I'm afraid were pretty awful. <laughs> oh, <the laughs> <laughs> but you had to say great. you had to say something about them and uh, there was you wouldn't want to say anything which would discourage them and I know on some the only things we could say was what you said. Uh, by you sure hit the board on that one. <laughs> Our Ted Jackson's favorite was, it's interesting, it's interesting. And so finally after a whole week of him teaching us, and this was at the Dune School, and he kept saying it's interesting, at the end of the week the class got together, we got out the, the dictionary, and we made a scroll and we put every word we could that he could use instead of the word interesting. <laughs> the teaching, learning, working, and critiquing have continued over the years. Since 1966, the members of five counties, renamed the Central Ontario Art Association, have been gathering at the Geneva Park YMCA camp on Lake Kuchiching. This September weekend combines the annual meeting and the inevitable fun nights with a wide selection of exciting workshops. That line is not some kind of decorative stripe on the paper. That line is you convinced that, yes, that's the line, that's where his backbone is. Yes, that, his, yeah, yeah, his legs ain't... Somehow or other, he finds a way to get us working hard. You know, he's urging you on, and he doesn't pull any punches. Uh, he doesn't mince his criticisms, and uh, he, he's free with his praises, too. Uh, very helpful should be a nice, beautiful, continuous flurry of drawing line that's reacting to you, feeling as if you're conjuring on that paper a three-dimensional form. Really what happens, you walk into a class like that with really no pre-concept of what you're going to do, and as soon as you watch that demo and see everything, you know, take place on that paper, you can't wait to get your brush in your hand. Yeah. And I went so fast, I've got one done, I want to get back and start another one. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> oh, give us a few minutes anyway. Okay. Listen, to take you back, you were president for a time, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, in the early 80s, I was president for two or three years. Yeah, yes. I know. And so what, what do you feel that COAA has meant to you? Well, let's go back to the beginning a little mm -hmm. bit, okay? About 1976 or 77, I decided I'd like to be a watercolorist. Took a few lessons, met some of the girls in Rockwood at a course with Jack Reed, and they said, join COAA. And I said, why should I join COAA? And they said, you love, and they could see I was really going. I really wanted to go. Mm -hmm. They said, you'll get all kinds of workshop information, etc." So I joined COAA, and that was terrific, because what it did for me in Hamilton, I was able then to go to Mississauga, Kitchener, you know, mm -hmm. all these different areas once a month if I wanted to, and take part in a workshop with a different instructor every month. Now, you know what that means. And then all of a sudden, you start looking, and you say, my God, aren't they gorgeous shadows? Look at the shape of those buildings. Isn't that beautiful? And you start seeing things you never saw before. It's incredible what it does. If you look at the weather, and we're in tune with the environment around us, then we can forget ourselves. Forget yourself and do something very much yourself on this paper so you can quit at will. You balance it with your thought. The teacher gets rather philosophical in her outlook. Uh, did you take to that? Yeah, it's nice to learn a little bit about everything. It's, it was really interesting. She kept it going really quickly all day. You finished a work in about two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah, it was really fast. Whatever you're doing comes out a little bit differently from other form of art simply because you need control, but you have to have the fearlessness of beginning. Another thing I think with, uh, with this Kuchiching weekend that helps you um, lose your inhibitions. And I think it's good for all artists to be with other artists in group sessions. Don't even have to work. Don't even have to paint just talk to each other and uh, as many times when you're at home the family is not into the arts and find you a little bit boring so you have to be careful but up here you can talk art to your heart's content and everybody's got something to say are you you aren't in this class are you no not in this class I just came in to look at all the wonderful work <laughs> how do you feel about this watercolor class this one this yeah. particular one I think it's really powerful. I think there's such a, well, uh, Frank Webb emphasizes design and it's really come through. All the paintings are really quite strong.
Al, this is your class. How do you feel about your cohorts and all these paintings? I think there's some pretty good stuff here. And uh, I think Frank Webb is just great. We love him. It's my second time of uh, having a class with Frank. Yeah. And do you uh, work in anything else but watercolor? No. <laughs> I'm still trying to get it straight. <laughs> I have a certain amount of delight in the way they dance on your paper. Well, of course, I'm enthusiastic about good work wherever I see it. I teach workshops over a great deal of North America, and I've always enjoyed coming here to uh, central Ontario and, and seeing the fine things the Canadians have done. They are always enthusiastic and responsive, and uh, that, I think, takes us a great, a long way toward getting victory over that intractable medium of watercolor. Where, where always decisions, you have to find, every time you make a move, you have to decision and ask this painting, where do you need it? As a program of various art forms, uh, I think this is the, the Kuchiching weekend is so important where we not only uh, offer the programs in the popular watercolors uh, and uh, oils. Uh, oils are coming back again. I, I feel we have to have a variety and I would like to experiment with many of these uh, opportunities. Well, the weekend does give uh, a chance for artists to try something entirely new entirely. and the teachers don't mind if you go in there and you've never tried their meat before. No, we've, been, we've been very fortunate yeah. in the teachers we've had. There, mm -hmm. uh, the, Very few of them they expect uh, masterpieces to be created <laughs> and and they they are all uh, the whole experience is to learn and not necessarily produce many coaa members produce works for local group or individual exhibitions they may also choose to enter pieces in the association's annual member show a juried exhibition held in a different community each year you say not, not all members uh, necessarily have to enter the show. No, it's purely their choice. Mm -hmm. If they've done something really good during the year and they feel very proud of it and they uh, select it out of all of the things they've done during the year and they put it to one side and they say to themselves, I'm going to put that into cross-section mm -hmm. and put their work in and take their chances and be rejected. Uh, just like I was. <laughs> oh, haven't we all been through that? <laughs> I think the first exhibition was in the Orangeville High School, uh, primarily because uh, not most of the pictures were coming from there, but because I knew the principal, Morris Klein, and had got to know him quite well. And uh, he, we trusted each other, and, and uh, he accepted my, my statement that, uh, uh, look, uh, this will bring not only attention to your school and, and uh, pleasure to those who are in the area who would like to, to see it, but it also uh, brings together one of the primary activities that, that you'll find throughout most of these district high schools. At first, Five Counties Art Association had local exhibitions in each county and were overwhelmed with the response. In 1957, private galleries were non-existent and public galleries were few, so artists were excited and a little intimidated at the prospects of showing their work. The memory that I have, I guess, uh, that is most vivid in, in my mind, um, the persuading of people to hang their art. Uh, now, that likely sounds rather peculiar, but it was difficult to, to get uh, people from these classes to, uh, first of all, accept the fact that it's, yes, I've arrived at a point where other people will be interested in my art. And the, the second problem was is it original or is it a copy? And I imagine that's still a problem possibly in some cases. A lot of the artists uh, in the association travel. 
they go to Greece and Portugal, and there was a few that were up in Baffin Island. So um, they go to Newfoundland, and they travel around. So there's a good selection of variety of subject matter, not just uh, a few flowers or, you know, the backyard scenes or something or like your that. Barns. Or your <laughs> barns. <laughs> good old barns. Yes, yeah. But I did paint a manure pile down at uh, St. Jacob's and uh, it was a giant manure pile. It smelled very, very badly and it had a wagon nearby and a bunch of chickens in the window looking at, out over the manure pile. And I put it in an exhibition over at uh, a gallery, the Corbett, Gal Corbett Grace Gallery, and it was the first painting that sold. And it sold to an embassy in Ottawa. <laughs> and I guess they thought, well, this is typical of Ontario. <laughs> it was a Czechoslovakian embassy, I think. Please. I've missed my calling. I should have stuck with manure piles. <laughs> so as, as art just goes in this circle, around and around, where it stops, nobody knows. But we were there during the period when it was exciting and it was experimental. It was wonderful. The interest generated by these early exhibitions showed that the arts could be viable in our cities and towns. Without the push of these pioneering art groups, it is doubtful that we'd have the many public and private galleries we enjoy today. The growth that has taken place in the arts since the end of the Second World War has helped to unite artists and viewers, the arts and society. At times, the arts can be divisive and controversial, but most importantly, art provides a valuable record of a changing world. In this program, we recall the hopes, dreams, and struggles of the people who built the arts at the grassroots level. We can't live in the past, but we shouldn't forget it. We hope you've enjoyed our loving look back at the development of the arts in the communities of Central Ontario.